Okay. So that's it. Okay. Thank you. Oh, okay. Good morning. Uh, so, so my topic is the uh, methods on the live front. Uh, so we start thinking about uh, methods and the QCD response stage. And then experimentally, there are also observations and methods uh, on different properties of the methods. Um, so for example, in the deep elastic scattering, the observation of vector mass on production, and also in the electron positron experiment, for example, the sort of scalar eta c is observed. Uh, and so this method system has drawn, has attracted many studies from both uh, experimentally and uh, theoretically. Uh, so the theoretical effort has been made from different perspective. Uh, so the first principle study, so for example, the Atlantis QCD, and also dyson schwinger equations. Uh, so they are formulated in the Lagrangian formalism, and they are usually formulated in the Euclidean space. And the, on the other hand, the different parts is to use the Minkowski um, formalism using the Hamiltonian formalism. So the Hamiltonian formalism and the Lagrangian formalism. Uh, so, so, so today we will focus on the Hamiltonian formalism. So in the Hamiltonian formalism, um, so from quantum mechanics, we know that a state, um, so the evolution of the state follows the evolution equation. And so the information of the system and the interaction are all contents in the Hamiltonian. And for a state that is the eigenstate, of the Hamiltonian, which is um, uh, stationary. Now this equation becomes the eigenvalues equation. And uh, the central task of the Hamiltonian formalism is the solve uh, the eigenvalue equation. Uh, and then from there, uh, the wave function then to describe the state uh, would tell us the information of the system. Uh, and then with the wave function, uh, it is very convenient and also powerful to calculate all kinds of observables. And one could even calculate uh, like the transitions between different state, like between uh, a different wave function of the state. Okay. So this is the idea of the Hamiltonian formalism. Uh, but here, uh, so you see the T is the time and H the Hamiltonian. Uh, we did not actually uh, specify what the time is. Uh, though regularly in the uh, instant form, we think about the time and the regular time. Uh, but actually when uh, we when we combine the uh, quantum mechanics to the uh, special relativity uh, to form the quantum field theory, uh, there are uh, multiple ways of choosing the time and the foliation of the space time. So if we think about the um, dynamics um, that can be uh, that the time can be chosen in different ways. Uh, so we are familiar with the instant form where time is uh, the x zero, uh, and then the Hamiltonian. So Hamiltonian is the one that is conjugate to time, conjugate to t. So in the instant form, uh, the regular time is the time and then the H is the Hamiltonian. And then the dispersion relation would be uh, what we see here, the P square equal to uh, square root of P perp square plus M square. So there's the square root there. And then the kinematical generators are those that uh, commute with the uh, Hamiltonian P zero, and then the uh, and then the dynamical ones are those not. And then, Alternatively, if we choose the time uh, as x plus, which is x zero plus x three, then the Hamiltonian that is conjugate to this x plus would be the p minus. And so the p minus would be the life round Hamiltonian. And then the dispersion relation would be much simpler. So you have the p minus equal to p of square plus m square over p plus. So there's no square root compared with the instant form. Uh, and also, uh, with this, 
we have one more, we have more, a more number of the kinematic terms. So we have seven um, kinematic term compared to uh, in the instant form, there are only three, uh, there are only six kinematic terms. So one has a, a larger kinematic group here. Uh, and so this front form dynamics is uh, especially favorable in this Hamiltonian formalism is that if you look at the instant form, so if I solve the eigenvalue equation with the Hamiltonian, then the instant form, uh, the Hamiltonian uh, can be negative because you're taking the square root there. So this means uh, the system, the Hamiltonian is unbounded from below. Uh, so if I want to uh, solve the method system from Hamiltonian formalism, uh, it would be uh, hard to get the uh, eigenstates starting from the uh, low-lying low state of the methods. Uh, on the contrary, in the front form, uh, so the P minus is, uh, is always positive uh, if we uh, disregard the zero modes. Uh, and then this means we have a series that is bounded from below. And when we solve the eigenvalue equation, we could get uh, the uh, spectrum of the bound, uh, bound state system. Uh, and then, which we will not discuss here, there are also other forms to do the, uh, to form the dynamics. So the point in the point form, uh, so this tau would be the time and then, uh, the Hamiltonian that is conjugated to tau would be the uh, uh, Hamiltonian in the point form, but it has a very uh, small uh, kinematic group. Uh, there are also two other forms, which is not uh, listed here. Uh, they are also not used uh, in practice since they have a much smaller kinematic group. Mm, in the point form, Ah, uh, I think this is uh, this is a constant. Uh, so I wrote it in the notes. So like uh, uh, for the uh, so for the front form, you could have the uh, x plus like uh, equal to some constant. So this a square here is also a constant. Uh, I don't recall exactly, but I put it in the notes. You can check it. Okay. Yes. Uh, and so with this, uh, we can uh, we can formulate the Hamiltonian of the system that we want to study, uh, and then we, one could solve the um, eigenvalue equation to get the state. So for methods, it's a QCT bound state. So we need to first derive the uh, Hamiltonian from QCD, and uh, so we choose the front form and then we uh, quantize the field on the x plus equal to zero, the equal light front time surface. And then uh, that would lead us to the uh, light front Hamiltonian. Uh, so now we will uh, derive, from, uh, derive the uh, QCD Hamiltonian right from the Lagrangian. Uh, so, so when I was preparing this, uh, I did not, uh, so, so I prepared it this way, but uh, uh, again, I've already uh, introduced this in the previous to this. Uh, so here, let's derive in detail. So this would also like a, a review of the derivation of the QCD Hamiltonian. Um, so I have a little different uh, convention on the metric. Um, so this means that um uh, so my x plus minus is x zero plus x minus x is three. So I don't have the square root of uh, two, uh, but then we need to keep track of those uh, metric. Uh, so that's the common thing. And then, uh, so with this, let us start with the Lagrangian. Uh, No, about the notation. Uh, so here, this uh, f mu nu, uh, let's write it out. Uh, 
Uh, so those A's are the color indices of the uh, A field. Uh, and then uh, for the D mu, Uh, so you see there are also this same A field in the D mu, uh, but here we do not have the explicit color indices. Uh, this is because in this term, uh, so we have the psi, so that's the fermion field. Uh, and if, so the fermion field lives in the fundamental representation uh, of SU3 group. Uh, so its color indices, if we write it out, um, equal to one, two, three. Uh, and when this A mu is in between of the psi by and the psi, uh, what is actually there is that, so this A mu without the color indices is actually, uh, you, we have, so. We have the contraction of uh, the color indices between A and the Gaumann uh, color matrix, this A. Uh, and then when this is in between the psi, if I also write out the uh, color indices for the psi by and the psi, um, so the contraction would be like this. So this T is a three by three matrix. So this is what it means here. Okay, uh, okay. I think that uh, explains the notations. Uh, and now, so to get the Hamiltonian, uh, what we do is we do a Lagrange transformation. So if we look at the Lagrangian, so this is actually, uh, if I written collectively, I can write it as um, a function uh, of the field and its derivative. And so what are the phi's here? Uh, so there's a gauge field and uh, we have the fermion field uh, and we can also count uh, the psi bar here. So those are the collection of the uh, phi gamma, the dependence of the Lagrangian there. Uh, so let us do uh, the transformation one by one. So first uh, we look at the gauge field a mu. Uh, and so um, so we want to, we need to write out the equation of motion. Uh, so so first, uh, let us define the generalized momentum field of the corresponding phi r. So that is derived as the following. So first, uh, this a mu as phi r. So what do we get um, for lambda kappa s? So we plug in a mu uh, in this equation, the pi, and what we get is this. And then to get the equation motion, we write down um, the derivative over uh, a. Okay. Uh, and then put it together uh, to write down, uh, I did not write down the uh, general form for equation of motion. Uh, okay. So now I have the uh, pi as a generalized momentum and also uh, this variational derivative. So I put it back into the equation of motion. And what I get for the A field is the color Maxwell equation. Okay. Uh, and here, so this 
GS is the current uh, and both times A and also the fermion field. Yeah. And then we work in the Lycon gauge. Um, so we have A plus equal to zero. Uh, and then, so for this equation of motion, uh, equation of motion of the A field, if we take the plus component, so, uh, sorry, this is lambda. If we take the plus component, so what we get is that it can be written as the following. Now, uh, let us put in the definition uh, of this F, the field tensor, for the lambda plus component. Okay. Uh, and so, uh, so here, if we invert the equation, so for the, we take out the A minus term. I would guess the following. Uh, so, so we do the uh, inversion because we want the uh, a minor standard alone on the right on the left hand side of the equation. So you can think about this uh, one over uh, partial plus uh, and the inverse of the partial plus. So what is partial plus? Mm -hmm. So it's uh, taking the derivative of the x plus uh, and then. Uh, so for one over partial plus, so I actually gave another way of writing it in the appendix. Uh, so you can also check later. So if it's acting, oh, oh sorry, I'm, I'm writing it wrong. So so when the plus is on the up, then this means it takes derivative on the uh, x lower. Uh, plus, uh, and uh, so the x lower plus is actually uh, one half of x upper minus. So it's this, no, it's this. Okay, so let's go back. Let me uh, write down this integral definition of one over partial plus. And this uh, epsilon is the anti-symmetric step function. Uh, so if I have epsilon plus this one x and this is zero. So this is uh, epsilon x, okay? Uh, and I leave an exercise that you can check that one over i partial x plus would bring the k plus uh, to the bottom for exponential function. Okay, uh, so with this, uh, let us continue. Uh, so now the observation here is that uh, for the a minus, uh, we get a constrained equation. The constrained in the sense that uh, if you look at uh, the equation here, So there's no uh, derivative about uh, the time, the x plus, x upper plus. Uh, so this means uh, the a minus is not uh, dynamical. And uh, so from here, let us also define the free field. So we use the tilde. Uh, so in the sense that it is the mu without theta in the limit of j goes to zero. So j is the coupling constant. So this means when uh, there's no coupling, uh, and so a tilde uh, in this sense means the free field. So in the Lycon gauge, so the plus component is zero. 
So the transverse component stays the same with the untilted one. And so for the uh, a minus one, if we take uh, in this equation, the j equal to zero, uh, what we get is that So this gave us a um, uh, constraint on the a minus, meaning that it can be uh, it can be determined once we know the transverse component uh, a i. Uh, so this means the a mu tilde is purely uh, transverse. So now we have the uh, now we get the equation motion for a mu, and we uh, find out its um, a dynamical component. Uh, let us continue with the Fermion field. Uh, so again, first we find it out, it's a uh, generalized momentum. Now here you see there's a uh, uh, one half here. If you go back to uh, the Lagrangian. Uh, so what we have here is that uh, for the Fermion term, it's written in this way, uh, but now since that we are considering the Lagrangian uh, and the dependence on a mu psi and also psi bar, so it would be uh, better to write this term explicitly uh, in the following. So let's write out uh, it as a two piece. So we have, so this d mu, uh, meaning it's acting on the side on the right, but it should also have a Hermitian conjugate term that is acting on the left. Mm -hmm. So, so now it's if I write it in this form, uh, when so the so the purpose is that when I do the uh, derivative, then I could. Uh, figure out the derivative on psi uh, more conveniently. Uh, so that is why here I have the i over two, okay? And then uh, the variational derivative. So rho synthesis, and I keep the arrow there. So meaning it's acting uh, on the left, on the sidebar. Okay, uh, so now I have both the pi and the uh, variational derivative. And let's put back into this uh, equation of motion. Uh, and so what we get is this equation. So this looks like the color Dirac equation, uh, but not uh, exactly in the in the form that we are familiar with. This is because this is actually the adjoint um, Dirac equation, adjoint color Dirac equation. Uh, now, to get the Dirac equation, so the sidebar, we know that it is like anger gamma zero. Uh, and if we uh, put it here and we take the a joint of the whole equation, uh, what we get is that we have negative i gamma mu dagger So we no longer have the arrow there because when we take the a joint of this equation on the side would be on the right hand side. And then we need to shift uh, gamma zero uh, all the way uh, to the uh, to the left side, and this will uh, give us a minor sign when it uh, uh, changes the order with gamma mu. So therefore, we get. Mm -hmm. Equal to zero. So this is the color Dirac equation. Uh, and uh, 
the equation of motion for the side field. So like what we did for the uh, gauge field, we also want to uh, find out what are the uh, dynamical component and what are not, what are not. Uh, so we define the psi plus minus by doing uh, a projection to the side field. And uh, so this projection operator is defined as this. So in Guillaume's uh, lecture, uh, so uh, he called this uh, the J and the B. And the correspondingly, you have the good and the bad. Okay. So they are the same. So these are so the lambda plus minus are the uh, projectors in, in the sense that you can check uh, the plus and the minus gives the complete identity. And then since it is a projector, meaning if uh, it acts on itself, I still get the projector. Okay. And also when you so if I project, uh, uh, sorry, I'm writing. I mean, if if I project on one weight first and then the other, I should get zero. So those are the its properties. Uh, now let's uh, apply um, this projection to the uh, color Dirac equation. Um, so what we can do is that uh, we first multiply uh, this equation of motion. Show me a field. Let's multiply by it on the left with gamma zero. So what we get is that we have Uh, and then so we can write it with the projectors that we have defined. Okay. Uh, so so here there's a lot of notation here. So this alpha i. Uh, so also put it in the appendix. Um, so that is uh, defined with gamma zero, gamma i. Okay. Uh, and so now we have, uh, so we can do the same by um, multiplying the equation on the left. So we can multiply it, the ball equation uh, with lambda plus, and also we can multiply it with lambda minus. And what we get is um, uh, a two coupled equation. Oh, yes, sorry. Yes, yes, this is gamma zero. Yes, okay. Okay, uh, and so we obtain a, a, a coupled uh, set of spinner equations. Uh, and so to write out, And then in the line point gauge, A plus equal to zero. So this A plus is also the two A lower minus. So this means um, this term is zero. Uh, and if we, so for the second equation, for the sine minus,
So what we are doing here is like uh, just as what we did <clears throat> for the gauge field, uh, we inverted this uh, partial minus to the other side of the equation. Uh, and again, like uh, for the, uh, and what we see with the A minus component uh, in, in the first case, uh, then here in this equation for the sign minus, there's no derivative on the x plus. So meaning it does not, there's no uh, dynamics. It does not uh, evolve over x plus. So what we have is that it, this is a constraint equation for sign minus, meaning when we know the sign plus component and we can determine sign minus from there. Uh, on the contrary, in the first equation, uh, for the side plus, uh, it would have the uh, dependence on x plus. So if we put this equation, so uh, let me call this one, two, and three. Uh, so so we get three from two, and now let us put three back into one. Um, so what we get is that. Plus. Okay, so now I only have the uh, side plus component in this equation. And uh, just as what we did for the uh, A field, uh, so here uh, we also define the free spinner, the free from field, uh, in the sense that if we take G as a coupling equal to zero, and we get this set yoda. Uh, And like the side, it we can also write it as the summation of the plus and the uh, minus component, the project, the projected one. Uh, so for the uh, side tilde plus, so that is the same as the untilted one. And we can see the minus. this um, so this is partial and this is alpha okay and then uh, so now we have um, the um, equation motion for the fermion field uh, and then similarly you could do a very similar calculation uh, for the sidebar and uh, then you can write out the its uh, generalized momentum and also the variational derivative and uh, get the equation motion. Uh, and not surprisingly, what you get would be uh, what we have here, the color Dirac equation. Okay, so now we have uh, all the information, all the ingredient we need for the Laurent transformation. Uh, so we have the Lagrangian and uh, we get the equation motion with the each field. And then now let's do the Laurent transformation to get to the uh, from Hamiltonian. So you need to be careful here is that, um, so we do the Laurent transformation uh, in relevant to X plus. And the note that, uh, so what is contrary to X plus with the metric we have is actually uh, one half uh, X minus. Or if you written differently, uh, this is the P lower plus. So this means when we do the Laurent transformation in respect to X plus, uh, what we get directly is the P lower plus that is contrary to X plus. So let us write on this. Next, I'm going to. 
And then, so we already have uh, those pi in the uh, previous derivation. Um, so you can plug in the result there. So what do we have? This. So this means the Hermitian conjugate term to the previous term. Uh, so the Laurent transformation of the Lagrangian gives the so p lower plus. So this is the actually the Hamiltonian density, and to get the Hamiltonian, so we need to integrate it over the volume. Plus, uh, so we write it more curly as the density. Mm -hmm. uh, so you see there's a factor two here. Uh, this is because first uh, the P minus, it should be um, the integral volume of the P upper minus, and that's where you get the two there. Okay, uh, so what we have is that, so we can put this into the integral and get the uh, life from Hamiltonian. Okay, and here, so for the convenience of the derivation, let us add a surface term uh, to the integral. So the term we end in is the, the this term. And then what we have would be okay, just to write it out explicitly. So I can combine this first term and this last term together. Uh, so they would become Uh, and now our P minus uh, have, uh, so you need to replace this uh, uh, curly two terms with this new term. Uh, so now let's look at the, um, it has two parts. So the first part is I have so F and then the second part, uh, I will look at this. Um, I think I missed something here is that um, hmm. The second term actually uh, they combine uh, into they combine into one because if you put the uh, partial plus and the a together it gives the uh, d plus. Okay. But now let's first look at the first term. Uh, so in the first term, uh, so. We can further simplify. Okay. 
So I'm just uh, switching this key to mu here. Uh, so if I write it out the component explicitly, is the transverse together and those with the plus component Mm -hmm. uh, so, so first uh, note that so uh, this f mu plus mu plus uh, back with the uh, so this term uh, it is actually the same with this term. Uh, it can be seen it's this relation. Okay, uh, and then. Uh, with so so this f mu nu is anti-symmetric, and when you have two f mu nu together, and uh, so the product would be symmetric, meaning these two terms are the same, and then these two terms are the same. Uh, so what we have out putting all this together, so from here to here, we collect all the terms. So this is what we have. And now we have two pieces. So this first piece is, uh, so we only have the transverse component. So that's actually the color magnetic part. Um, so if we put in, write it out uh, explicitly with the definition of the F mu nu. Uh, so what we have in the end would be, So that's the uh, color magnetic part. And the, the second piece. Only contains the plus minus component. And this is the color uh, electric part. Um, so also with its definition, plug in the corresponding part. And we only have this two term is because we recall that we are working in the Lycon gauge. So A plus is equal to zero. And then with the, um, so we can use the metric to put all component with the only the upper uh in the, uh, upper the superscript uh and uh, recall that uh, previously uh, when we look at the um equation motion for the a field we found out that for the a minus it's actually a constrained equation and if you go previously and plug in the um 
constraint equation that we have derived. Uh, and what we have all together. It's the following. So, so it should be a minus sign. Okay. And so uh, with this uh, f plus minus f plus minus and then the uh, also the transverse part, uh, we get the um, explicit expression for the first part. And now we go to uh, the second part. So for the second part, uh, if first we put this together so and so I just said you can uh, so it's just a uh, um, combining this partial plus and a plus in into this d plus Uh, so let us first write out this uh, uh, sidebar and the side dagger comma zero. And now you recognize this gamma zero gamma plus and twice our projector lambda plus. And then, so the property for the projector is that it is equal to its square. Okay. Because when you pr project the psi once, uh, it's already in the psi plus, and then you project it the second time, you should stay in the same way. And so this means, so this upper, this is dagger, and then this is. We can write it with the purely the uh, plus the projected side. Okay. And then with the, um, if we continue and uh, write this out, with the equation motion that we get uh, previously for the side plus. So you can check, go back, check the previous derivation. Uh, so what we get is the following terms. Uh, and now, so this one, this one, this one, this one. Yes, 
So what the first one is, is that, uh, well, I don't think I have time to go uh, all the details there, but you can check uh, in the notes if you are interested. So this will lead to, like this. Mm -hmm. And the second one. This turn. And shift one. Okay, and uh, so with this, we get the whole uh, life from Hamiltonian written out explicitly. Uh, so just to uh, remind ourselves, so this one, two, three together gives us this term. Uh, and then we have already uh, got the, the red, the first term. And uh, putting all this together, you get the so if we write it all together um, we have the full uh life front QCD Hamiltonian. Okay. So that's what we have derived. Uh, and now, so those tilde are the uh, free field that we have defined. Uh, so from now on, we will get rid of this tilde with the understanding that uh, this, uh, those field meaning uh, the free field. So this stay with the same definition that we have. It's just for the convenience of uh, writing. Uh, we will get rid of those tilde from now on. Now let's see what we have in this P minus QCD. Uh, so the first two terms are the kinetic energy term. So uh, one for the gluon, the gauge field, and then the mm -hmm. other for the fermion, the quark and the antiquark. Uh, and then, so, what following, so those are all the uh, interaction terms. Uh, so in the second line, um, the three terms, they actually can be uh, written together and this, and it contains the three gluon, uh, the three gluon interaction and the gluon emission and the quark antiquark pair production term. So if I, uh, Right, draw it and the uh, my diagram, it be, would be like this. So the one have three A is this, and then you would have the uh, gluon emission from, from the fermion line. And then uh, in the third line, so we have a term like this. So recall that how we get this partial plus. So we get this when we uh, do the, when we uh, derive the equational motion uh, for the field and we invert it uh, from the left-hand side of the equation to the right-hand side. So that's why we have the one over partial plus square. And when we draw uh, the Feynman diagram, so, this partial plus square uh, in the denominator uh, is drawn as this, the so-called instantaneous line. So you have this, because it, uh, it is not an actual uh, field as the, in the other terms. So, but it's still like uh, you, you take the partial plus of the field. So it's like an exchange of gluon, but instantaneously. So that's why it's called the instantaneous interaction. And so this term would contains this three diagram, uh, because in the J, if you go back, check the definition for J, they are both the fermion field and also uh, the A field. And then this last term, 
Oh, sorry, uh, I missed this term. So this term you have the four A there. Uh, so that is the four gluon interaction. So this one. And then the last term, uh, we again have this uh, partial plus uh, in the bottom. And uh, recall that we get this when we uh, derive the equation motion for the side field. And uh, uh, we invert it from the left-hand side of the equation to the right-hand side. And the graphically, this partial plus is showing as the, uh, the fermion line with this dash. So that's the instantaneous quark interaction. Okay, uh, so now we have the minus QCD, and then with the continue with the life from quantum field theory is that we do the quantization at the x plus equal to zero surface, and with this we can uh, expand the field both the sine and the, uh, and the a uh, with its uh, Fourier representation. So. This mu and nu are the spinners uh, that for the fermion field, and then this epsilon mu are the polarization vector. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and they follow the uh, standard uh, commutation and anti commutation re uh, relation uh, and to the equal life from time. Okay. Uh, so now we have the uh, life from QCD Hamiltonian. And we can continue with the methods. Uh, so the reason we do this derivation is because the methods um, is the QCD bound state. And to uh, get methods uh, when solve the uh, eigenvalue equation, uh, and which takes the QCD Hamiltonian as the input. So first we look at the uh, Fox space representation. Uh, so in the Fox space representation, so the methods, so if I write the methods and the uh, uh, state vector, so it it contains the, it can be seen as the integral uh, of the uh, excitation of the different modes. So those say contains um, the creation operator of quark, anti-quark, and also uh, gluons, and they act on the vacuum. So this is the fog vacuum and with the corresponding uh, indices. So those indices uh, includes the color uh, like from helicity. Yeah. So those quantum numbers. Uh, and so, so here in this equation, we are written as a single particle co coordinates, meaning so those kappa uh, i are the coordinates for the ice particle. So, so it would be preferable to write it in the relative particle coordinate. So the definition is not following. So we have the xi as the longitudinal momentum fraction. Uh, so this is the kappa i. So for the, the, the p plus for the ice particle divided by p plus, and then um, the relative transverse momentum, uh, the ki perp and the, and the single particle k perp minus x times the uh, center mass, so the total uh, p minus. And so the nice thing about this relative coordinate is that it is invariant under the uh, Lorentz boost. So let us check this uh, explicitly. Mm. Um, so we have we have the definition. So that's the longitudinal momentum fraction. And the relative one. Uh, so what are the Lorentz boost? So the first Lorentz boost is the um, uh, transverse boost. So in this sense, if we consider a four vector V, its plus component does not change. It's transverse component. Become this. And this beta perp is just a, a C number. So you can think about it as some constant. So with this 
uh, transformation, uh, what happens to Xi is that now since both the plus component does not change, uh, it still uh, stays the same. And for, uh, so this notation, I cannot see it. It's not clear here. Maybe, uh, so you see these two key are different. So this is the single particle one. So this is the single particle one. The relative. So the single particle just was component. It becomes plus and what is plus its plus component is the ki plus theta plus and uh, what is the ki plus if we write it with the xi so that is just xi p plus okay and we know that the p plus would be um, plus p plus Data. Mm -hmm. And uh, so these are the uh, transformation of the single particle one and then the total one. And uh, so to put them into the relative one, you can see that the, uh, so the one that is proportional to the beta, they would cancel out. So this relative momentum Ki perp would stay the same. Okay. And uh, then the other boost down the longitudinal direction. So the transverse one would stay the same. And uh, so all the transverse component uh, would stay the same. Uh, and then what happens to the uh, plus component is that they are all scaled by the same, so this is just the same number, by the same constant. So then the Xi, the longitudinal momentum fraction, will stay the same, and the Ki perp will also stay the same. Now, this is a very nice feature, is because if you think about um, in terms of the uh, the state, so the hadron state. So oh, I think I did not mention that. Uh, so this psi is the lifelong wave function. So it's just uh, the coefficients when you expand uh, the state in the Fox space. And uh, so, so the thing is that with what we have seen that we, if we write this wave function in terms of the relative coordinates, it is a boost invariant because it does not change under the Lorentz boost. This means if we solve the uh, lifelong wave function, which tells us the internal structure of the state, and when we boost it to a different frame, the wave function stays the same. Uh, and then, so this is just using the relative coordinates to write out uh, the vector state. And we have the lifelong wave function in the relative coordinates. And so it uh, satisfies a certain normalization relation. So this is just uh, writing it out explicitly. And uh, so for the QQ bar Fox sector, uh, so uh, we can have the, so if we only consider the meson and the QQ, uh, only have the QQ bar component. Uh, and uh, so the longitudinal momentum fraction, so X, now it's usually defined as that of the quark and uh, the relative uh, transverse momentum k perp is defined this way. So uh, similar to what we have seen for the uh, general form. Uh, and now the, uh, the state in the QQ bar Fox sector uh, would can write as the following. Mm -hmm. So this is the mass on, uh, life from wave function and how the mass on state is represented in the Fox space. Uh, and uh, so to continue to actually figure out what the life from wave function is, we need to solve the 
uh, eigenvalue equation as we have talked in the very beginning. So we need to uh, solve the eigenvalue equation. And so here, we call that, so this H uh, left front uh, is written in this way. So we call, so the P minus is what we have just seen as the uh, P minus QCD, the left front QCD Hamiltonian. And uh, so it is your convenient to refer to the left front Hamiltonian, the HLF, this way is because uh, if you look at the dispersion relation, uh, this H is what uh, correspond or what gives you the eigenvalue of the m square to so the invariant mass of the mass on, or the so h here state for the hadron uh, the bond state and uh, so um by solving uh, this eigenvalue equation the state we get uh, can be labeled with the six eigenvalues so mh is the its mass and then it also has the p plus and then the uh, transverse p perp and the total spin and then its longitudinal uh, projection. So that's the MJ. So we can label a state with those quantum numbers. Uh, so for our mass on state, uh, if we uh, look at its uh, Fock space representation, so we can uh, expand its state uh, with um, increasing number of for component, so the the leading of the valence fog sector is the PQ bar, and then we have PQ bar galore and PQ bar, PQ bar. So and this expansion is infinite, and uh, of course if you can solve this uh, problem with the QCD Hamiltonian in the infinite fog space, then we get the true uh, mass on state as the QCD eigenstate. But in practical calculation, we can. This is not uh, uh, possible to do an infinite calculation. So what one do is one truncate the fog space uh, to the finite or to the leading fog sectors and get the wave function uh, from there. Um, so, so to think about this way, so we can truncate. Sorry, I cannot write. Um, uh, it frees somehow. Um, it's. I think it's just that a note is frees. Okay. Um. So, so we will truncate the fog space. Okay. I think I can continue with this. Uh, and then. The truncated space, if we call it as the uh, P space, um, then we we would lose some information, right? So if we solve the mass on state in only in the Q bar sector, we would lose the information in the higher Fox sector. Uh, so one way to uh, to solve the state in the smaller basis space, but also get some information from the higher Fox sector, uh, is with the following strategy. So, so P is the space that we are actually solving the state, but uh, we also like to uh, put in the information from the higher Fox space. Let's call it Q uh, effectively. So the way that we write the uh, eigenvalue equation uh, in this with this partition on the P and the Q space, uh, and then what we get would be the following. So we can check this by acting the Hamiltonian on the side. And this side has both the P component and a Q component. And then, so from the second equation, uh, so, so because we are only uh, solving the uh, problem in the P space, so we want to write out the equation with the P component only. So the second equation would give us the following. So it can actually give us a relation of the Q component and the P component. Uh, and so if now I plug this back to the first equation, what I get would be an equation that only 
has the p component and this is just what we want because we want to solve the problem in the smaller p space but uh, have some information from the q space so this would be the ex expression the general expression and then specifically oh but there's a problem there you see that uh you see that okay so this is good i can solve my problem in p space with some interaction in the q space uh but note that here what is this omega so this omega should be the eigenvalue of the hamiltonian but i do not know this omega before i solve the uh, problem right uh, so this means i have the unknown here so if you plug this part here you have omega on both sides of the equation and so one way to treat it is that uh, you assign omega with some initial value and you solve this equation uh, iteratively until your omega is the same as the uh, eigenvalue you get and then you get the equation and another way to do it is that uh, we can approximate this omega. So this omega is actually what this here is the energy denominator. We can approximate it by the kinetic energy, the, en uh, the average kinetic energy of the initial and the final p, uh, p space. Uh, notice that here, what is this effective uh, Hamiltonian has is that so first your state comes initially start with the p space and then it travels to the q space and then it comes back to the p space so this is what this effective term means and in a, to be more specific let's look at our uh, p space and the q0 as in the qq bar sector so this is not our p and this is the Q space. Uh, and so uh, the goal is to solve uh, this eigenvalue equation in the you know, only in the Q bar sector. And so let us first write out all the possible interactions. Uh, so the way to do it is that so this is the initial state space and then this is the final space. So with the Hamiltonian that we have derived and also with the uh, diagram representation when can find out uh, all the interaction terms so from qq bar to qq bar so you have these two terms the uh, instantaneous gluon one and then the second one is like this but this will the second term will vanish because if you look, check the uh, color structure if you calculate the color factor explicitly for the qq bar as a, a color singular state this would vanish and then from qq bar to qq bar gluon uh, you would have the term like this. So you will have uh, the gluon uh, emission. And then in the QQ bar gluon to QQ bar gluon sector, so you would have all those interactions. Um, but those in the red frame, uh, they will not be counted uh, for the criteria of, um, of gauge cutoff. So the criteria is like this. So those instantaneous terms, they would be only counted if the corresponding dynamical sector would exist. So what this means is that, for, so for example, if we look at uh, this one, so if I count the total number of states and the uh, instantaneous, the intermediate state, what I get if I count the particle. So I have QQ bar and I have two gluons there okay and uh, so this means that i would only consider or i would only include this interaction into my calculation if uh, i have the qq bar gluon gluon sector okay uh, otherwise i would not include those uh, interactions okay and then to look at the this effective terms that comes uh, that is from zero to one so from qq bar to qq bar gluon and then comes back and then with the energy denominator that is approximated with the uh, average kinetic energy term uh, as we have said previously so 
what we would get is the Wang-Gulang exchange term. So, um, so this is like you uh, stitch this diagram and uh, this diagram together. So you would get these four terms. And so the last two terms are the uh, self-energy correction to the uh, quark and anti-quark. They will not be included. And so the first one is the effective uh, one good one exchange. So written explicitly, uh, it would have this expression. So now what uh, contains in the Hamiltonian is that we have the kinetic energy term, uh, and then we also have the uh, Van Coulomb exchange. Uh, so I don't think I have time to derive this explicitly now, but it's a good exercise to check that the kinetic energy term for the uh, QQ bar state would have the following expression. Uh, so with the relative variable that we have defined. Okay, uh, and now, so with this, we can uh, try to solve the mass on state. Uh, and in practical calculation, so now, so if you recall our previous picture, so this is, uh, so we get this from kind of a bottom up approach from the QCD Hamiltonian. But then in the uh, phenomenological study, there are also some input from the observation with the experiment. So that would also give us constraint in getting the left front wave function. Uh, and also uh, studies from other formalism could also uh, give some constraint on the left front wave function. So in practical calculation, uh, we could also, so besides the first two terms, one could also uh, put in a phenomenological term. Uh, so here, what I introduce here is a, um, is a work that is done with the BFQ formalism. So it put a phenomenological confinement potential. So the idea, uh, so the expression for the confinement potential is it's quite simple. So you have this, um, uh, uh, harmonic oscillator potential for the transverse direction. And then you also have a longitudinal confinement. And uh, putting them together, you have the three-dimensional confinement. And then a constraint, uh, a nice thing about this uh, effective term is that uh, if you look at the QQ bar in the non-relativistic limit, meaning the heavy quarkonium. So if I take the non-relativistic limit, so meaning so X goes to uh, one half, the large normal momentum fraction goes to one half. Uh, and then uh, I would have a very large quark mass. Uh, the X direction, yes, so the uh, x minus direction. But this x is uh, what we have uh, defined earlier, that's the longitudinal momentum fraction. So, so the x is the p plus of the quark divided by the total, yes. So in the, in the non-relativistic limit, so these two pieces can be put together into the three-dimensional harmonic oscillator potential. Okay. Uh, so that's so that's what is used uh, in the uh, practical uh, research work. Uh, so now uh, I think I have introduced the um, basic idea of the uh, framework I would call to study the meson state using the life from Hamiltonian formalism. Uh, so in the next, I will introduce two specific studies on it. Um, let's see. So the first one is the um, the basis life front compensation. Oh, oh, I see. No, no, my problem. I cannot write there. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, okay. 
So the basis of lifelong quantization, so it's a lifelong Hamiltonian formalism as we have seen already. So the special feature about it is that it's the basis here. So what basis here means um, like uh, literally as the word implant, it means that when I solve the eigenvalue equation, I look at the state as um, the expansion on some basis state. So this is the coefficient and this is the basis state. And for the basis state, I can choose uh, a, a function representation. Uh, so such that uh, I can, so such that the basis space contains um, like for the state is the vector in the chosen basis function representation. And then the Hamiltonian would be a, matri a matrix in the same basis. And then one can solve the argument. There's a question in the chat. Okay. Mm -hmm. So instantaneous Gurun should also be counted in the method like other gluon in the mass of state. Ah, yes. Sorry, I think, uh, yeah, I I think what you mean here is, yes, so so this, so what I draw here is the interaction. So you are talking about this term. Yes, so for the calculation, if you include the QQ bar gluon sector, then you should have this. So if you count the particle state, this is the QQ bar gluon, it should be, included but if you when you actually calculate uh, this uh, this diagram it would act as a mass counter term uh, to the uh, kinetic energy term yes so so the answer is that yes from first principle uh, if you have the kikubak luan then you should have this diagram and when you do the practical calculation like you have a semi phenomenological uh, effective Hamiltonian, and you have a quark mass, especially when you have a quark mass as a free parameter, then you effectively include the instantaneous uh, diagram and the mass counter term. Okay, so, so that's the treatment on that. Okay, uh, and now coming back here, so with the basis representation, uh, so uh, so the nice thing about the basic representation is that we have the freedom of uh, choosing uh, of choosing the basis <clears throat> for the specific Hamiltonian. So if your basis function is close to the <clears throat> eigen <clears throat> eigen function of the Hamiltonian, then it would uh, uh, highly uh, benefit the efficiency of your numerical calculation. Uh, so here, let me just, uh, let's do a very brief review on the basis life from quantization approach. So this is, it is first applied to the heavy quaconian system. Uh, so that's like the first thing you do when you use Hamiltonian formalism to study methods, because for heavy quaconian it's close to the non-relativistic uh, the uh, system and you can check in this specific limit. Uh, but here when we actually do the uh, uh, do, do this uh, calculation, the heavy quaconia is treated as a relativistic bound state. So we have already seen that the, this is the kinetic energy term and that is the Van Gogh exchange. And then this confinement is a, a phenomenological potential that contains the QCD holographic transverse one and also the longitudinal one. And then for the basis, in terms of basis, so the basis functions are chosen as the eigenfunctions of H0. So H0 contains the first two part. So this means uh, in practical calculation, when I diagonalize my Hamiltonian, so what I actually need to do is to diagonalize the Van Gogh exchange term because if you choose the eigen basis function as the eigen function of this part, uh, the basis is uh, so you already know the most of the um, structure in the for the first two terms. So this would make the numerical calculation uh, very efficient. And then by solving the eigenvalue equation, 
So what one gets is the whole spectrum of the state. So this is the mass spectrum uh, for different mass on state for the charmonia and the bottomonia. And then the wave function, uh, so you you get so when you solve the eigenvalue equation, so together with the eigenvalue as the mass, you also get the wave function for each state. So that's the powerful thing about using this life from Hamiltonian formalism is that you get the uh, whole spectrum together and then you get the wave function uh, for each state. Uh, and then following this, then they're started with the uh, unequal mass, uh, heavy mass on, so the B sub C uh, is still with the same Hamiltonian, but now I can assign it from the mass to the quark and the anti-quark, and the one can get the uh, solve the system for also the heavy light mass on, so like D and the D sub S. Then uh, then there's work also on light methods. So still with the same Hamiltonian, but there's uh, an additional term uh, called the gamma five. Uh, this is because the, uh, of one difference between the light method system to the heavy method system is that there's uh, the pyro splitting term there, uh, the pyro splitting there. So if we stay with the previous Hamiltonian, so this um, the panel mass you get would be higher, much higher than the PDG one, and then this uh, the addition of the gamma five term here, then one could fit the uh, spectrum much better as in the uh, right panel shown here, uh, and then um uh, I'm almost done, <laughs> sorry, and then the. A, a challenging but a very important direction to go with this uh, Hamiltonian method is then to uh, include uh, the next uh, Fox sector. So as in this work and also many ongoing works. So now that we have the study on the QQ bar sector, uh, what if we end the QQ bar gluon sector? So with this QQ bar gluon sector and it explicitly, the van gluon exchange term is no longer an effective uh, interaction that we have seen uh, with the derivation, but it would be uh, include, included uh, automatically when you uh, can when you uh, write out the Hamiltonian in this uh, Fox space, okay. uh, and they also calculate the uh, mass spectrum and get wave function from there. And then, uh, so I said I will introduce uh, two uh, works, and then the second one is a small basis life from wave function. So we have seen that with the basis life from the quantization, uh, when get all those states and the uh, mass spectrum by solving the Hamiltonian. So it is very nice, and then you can use the wave function to calculate observables. Uh, but one thing is that. Uh, uh, this is a numerical method, so the wave function you get is also numerical. Um, and uh, so to, to compensate the uh, inconvenience of further use this wave function, uh, so we, we propose another way of uh, studying the mass and life wave, wave function uh, is to design it directly. So of course, this is less fundamental. This is not uh, like from first principle, uh, but the purpose is that it could give you a, a wave function that has a much simple functional form that one can easily use it to start a uh, different processes like the vector mass on production. So this is like, uh, uh, this is in the same category of the widely used uh, boosted Gaussian uh, wave function. So here I will just introduce the basic idea. Uh, the basic idea is that if you, uh, we can write the wave function as the uh, uh, expansion on some basis. Uh, and uh, of course, we need to choose a basis function that to let it have some simple function, functional form and also return physical interpretation of the system. Um, so we do this by choosing um, the, uh, the basis function the same as what I have introduced to you in the B of Q Hamiltonian. So this would help us inherit some physical interpretation there. And then, uh, what is left to be determined is the basis coefficients and also some parameters in the basis function, like the quark mass and the 
uh, confining strength in the compound. And so this is a general idea. And then in, determine, uh, in determining those uh, parameters, so one needs some constraints. So the constraints include, for example, the wave functions of different meson state should be uh, also normal. Uh, and then one could calculate physical quantities from this wave function, such as the decay constant, uh, the, the decay waves, and also the uh, the, the radiative transition base. So this could uh, work as a constraint to help us determine the uh, coefficients. And then, so with this, we find the coefficients. And once you find the coefficients, determine the parameter, uh, then you get the wave function, and then they are ready uh, to use. Uh, and so in specific, we use the decay constant and uh, also the two photon transitions uh, to determine uh, the parameters. Uh, so that's all uh, love today. So we have uh, derived the QCD Hamiltonian on the left front and say how one can use that to, to study the meson state. Uh, so in the next lecture, I think on Friday, we will continue with to see how to use the left front wave function uh, to study uh, physical quantities uh, like form factors and the transition form factors. So that's all. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think it's, um, uh, so, so it's like, a, when, like, for example, in a specific, uh, basis space, is that what you mean? So, like, you, um, numerically, so it's writing out, so this age, so in this basis space, like, um, Mm, maybe this is initial beta i and the final beta j. So I have like a beta one and the h. So in short time notation, one, two, and the h, maybe two, one. And oh, of course, there are also, you should have some, oh, there are also some truncation on the basis space because you cannot do infinite one. And so you have this Hamiltonian and uh, you might, uh, so the way, to, so so to solve this, so the way you solve this eigenvalue equation is to diagonalize this Hamiltonian. And when you diagonalize this Hamiltonian, so the eigenvalues, so you have an array of the eigenvalues. So lambda one, lambda two, lambda n, and then you also have the corresponding eigenstate, right? And then, so this eigenvalues, so we know the uh, life from Hamiltonian correspond to the M square. So that would be the mass on mass. And then the eigenstate would be uh, the mass on state. Yes. And you also know the, the uh, you mean the mass? So, uh, this is meaning. So, if you because in the uh, if you think about in the um, in the folk space representation. The, the pion, it can, so for example, the pion here, it can, it has an infinite expansion in the Fox space. It could contain multiple gluons or even multiple qubit pair, right? Okay. Yes. So, so the real pion is not just the qubit Yes. Yes. Or effectively, if you think about uh, just as the QQ bar, and then you think about its mass as the, like uh, the, not just as the bare mass, but uh, like addressed, so yeah. So then in this language, it means you have multiple yeah. Yes. Uh, 
but, but we even have different uh, um, different state so for example if you think about it so so how do you really define a measure so the higher order the difference the measure states we have addition mm. higher order so how do you really define a physical Oh, the physical one is the uh, eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, and then um, I think what you mean is that so so the actual the physical one is the eigenstate of the Hamiltonian in the full Fox space, and then in practical calculation you truncate the Fox space. Like uh, so, so the sim the simplest uh, thing one start with is just in the like here in the just in the TQ bar fox sector. Then your wave function also only have the TQ bar component. Yes. So so that is the um, um not sure this answers your question. So this is like uh, you 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 only have the um the physical um method stage in the truncated Fox space. Multiple basis. Ah, yes, yes. So yes, so this is uh, so this is what I mean when you diagonalize the Hamiltonian. So you you get a spectrum of the eigenstates. So like for the um for the Chamonia system, so the lowest one you see is the eta c, and then you have the J sign. Yes. Yes. Also correspond to long term in the diagonal matrix. Yes, yes. Then uh, with the glue, then here meaning so your beta, uh, you have some like uh, you have a kick bar component, and you also have the um, the kick bar glue component, and then uh, what you get. So your eigenstate would also be some, uh, let's say, linear combination of the Kiko bar state. Yes. Yes. Okay. So then you have to reduce by matrix. You have to expand this. You expand this with both space, right? Mm. So you just let's say you only have Kiko bar state and Kiko bar state, Two, two, two. Yes. Uh, oh, it's just uh, like uh, for part of your basic state, it will correspond to like a QQ bar. And then you have some basic states that correspond to QQ bar glue. Yeah. Okay. Questions? Um, could you also share your notes about the difficulties? Oh, okay. Questions, rather than this. Yes. Any question from the Zoom? Okay. Not a extreme measurement. Sure. Ah, we did. We already started. Good.